everyone, and thanks for joining us on Diplomatic Channel. I'm Tenyo Lash Shobowale. On the program this week, South Africa's Archbishop Desmond Tutu dies at the age of 90. Tributes pour in from around the world. Later, we take a look at the 2015 Iran nuclear deal as signatories meet for talks to save the agreement. Amid fears, Iran is weeks away from a point of no return on nuclear weapons. But first, let's begin the program by taking a quick check on discussions in diplomatic circles. The U.S. is to lift travel restrictions it imposed on eight Southern African nations over the Omicron variant. The White House says the November 29 measure affecting South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Namibia, Lesotho, Eswatini and Malawi will be lifted by New Year's Eve. U.S. officials said the curbs are no longer necessary amid a U.S. explosion of cases of the Omicron variant. Japan will not send a government delegation to next year's Winter Olympics in Beijing, a move that stops short of joining a U.S.-led diplomatic boycott of the Games, but one nonetheless likely to deepen tension with China. The boycott, driven by Washington and including some of its allies, has become another delicate issue for Japan, a close partner of the U.S. that has also strong economic ties to China. Japan will instead send some officials with direct ties to the Games. The diplomatic boycott of the U.S. and other countries stems from concerns about human rights in China, but Japan has taken a softer tone on the issue. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin has called the diplomatic boycott of the upcoming Beijing Winter Olympics by the United States and its allies a mistake driven by a desire to restrain China's development. It says Washington will not prevent China's emergence as a global competitor by dragging politics into sports. Polish Prime Minister Matthijs Morawiecki has said the European Union misinterprets powers that had been conferred on it after the EU's executive said it was beginning infringement proceedings against its country. Last week, the EU started legal steps against Poland over the country's constitutional court, which challenged the primacy of EU law. Poland has two months to respond to the letter of formal notice in a process that could see additional fines placed on Poland by the EU. South Africa is holding a week of events to mark the passing of the anti-apartheid leader, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who died on Sunday, aged 90. The plans include two days of lying in state before an official state funeral on January the 1st in Cape Town. Tributes have poured in from leaders around the world, including Queen Elizabeth II, U.S. President Joe Biden and Pope Francis. Also paying tribute, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa describes him as one of the nation's finest patriots. We have lost one of the most illustrious, courageous and beloved amongst us. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was one of our nation's finest patriots. He was a man of unwavering courage, of principled conviction, and whose life was spent in the service of others. He in many ways embodied the essence of our humanity. He knew that apartheid would one day end and that democracy would come. He knew that our people would be free one day. By the same measure, he was convinced even to the end of his life, that poverty, hunger, misery can be defeated, that all people can live together in peace, security and comfort. He was a man of faith who throughout his life gave expression to the biblical teaching that without actions, faith is dead. For Desmond Mpilo Tutu, it was not enough that he should preach peace. He had to join with the people of this country, and indeed the people of all countries, in working tirelessly and diligently for the attainment of peace. 
Nigeria President Mohamed Buhari is condoled with the people and leadership of South Africa after the passing of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. In a statement, he described the Archbishop as a clergyman who provided healing and direction for his country and the world following his role in the fight against apartheid, prolonged exile, and also his role in heading the Truth and Reconciliation Commission under Nelson Mandela. Also joining leaders across the world to mourn the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Nigeria's former president, Olusegun Obasanjo, describes his death as a great loss to his country, South Africa, and the African continent. In an exclusive interview, Chief Obasanjo says he would be missed by all, especially by him, as he was highly instrumental to his becoming the president of Nigeria after he was released from prison. I remain uh, eternally grateful to him. When I came out of prison and I had this uh, decision to make, pressure was mounting on me to come and contest the presidency of Nigeria. Apart from consulting with people in Nigeria, there were two South Africans I consulted, Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela said to me, when, when I told him, I said, look, I came out of prison, this pressure was mounting. He said, follow your uh, intuition. I said, thank you. Uh, Madiba. Desmond Tutu, when Desmond Tutu listened to me, he said, hmm, my brother, what you are saying is that your country wants you to serve, and you are saying you have served before and you went to prison, and you don't want to serve again. I said, no, 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 that's not quite what I'm saying. He said, say it again. I repeated myself, and he said, well, the same story I've got. And my brother, go back home and serve your people. There are no two ways about it. We are gradually getting to the end of an era, the era of apartheid. And this was an era that we should not forget easily. People like Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, Luthuli, those who believe that we were all human beings created in the image and likeness of God, and we don't know whether God is a black man, or a white man, or a yellow man. The pigmentation of our color derives from where we live on the planet. And this is not an issue that we should forget. And those who fought against it are heroes and we should guard them as such, we should treat them as such, we should remember them as such, and history should record them as such. I met him, I met Desmond Tutu, who, apart from being a humanist, a humanist, he was also a great Christian. And they don't always go together. I was in South Africa where somebody took the Bible, an Africaner, and said, it is in the Bible that the black man is an inferior human being. And I disputed that with him. And he was supposed to be a Christian. So, 
Desmond Tutu will always be remembered for being a humanist and being a great Christian, a great man of God. Not only that, he had tremendous sense of humor. Um, when I was part of eminent persons group of the Commonwealth, and we met Desmond Tutu on a number of occasions. And as co-chair, I had to meet him one-on-one uh, -on, -one on, a num on a few occasions. And one occasion, he said, my brother, you know, those people who you think are fond of me, that's not to do, that's not to do. Is I am not carried away. They are not as fond of me as they appear. It is because my name is so simple to pronounce. Desmond Tutu. If it's a tongue-twisting Kosa name, they will not, I will not be, uh, they will not be as fond of me as they appear. That is Desmond Tutu's uh, sense of humor. I will say this to my brothers and sisters in South Africa, I will, uh, heartfelt condolence. We have lost a great South African, a great African, a great uh, man of black race, a great uh, uh, a, Greek, a great Christian, a great moral compass. For more insight into who the man Desmond Tutu was, our South Africa Bureau Chief Betty Dibia spoke with someone who worked closely with him. Reverend Frank Chikane, moderator of the Commission of the Churches on International Affairs for the World Council of Churches. Let's take a listen. He stood for justice, and it didn't matter who was involved and how powerful they were during the apartheid uh, time. And he stood for justice even during our democracy. He spoke against any injustices he could see amongst us. He stood for justice internationally. I mean, even the issues about Palestine, where many people would uh, fear to talk about, uh, Desmond Tutu will take a stand. Um, and so this is the legacy, I mean, we will always remember. But, you know, I've got personal experiences with him yes. that when I came back from uh, underground to a charge for treason, we get acquitted when we come back, they want to arrest us again. We went underground. And then I was appointed General Secretary of the Council of Churches. Yes. And I had to go and appear at his house for the first time because we knew the police would want to arrest me. And indeed, they were waiting for me at his gate. And he stood between me and the police and said, this is my home. You can't come and arrest him here. And, and so he was very bold and they drifted away. We know that the arch loved to laugh. Remember his very high pitched cackle, you know, when he would laugh, he loved to dance. And he had an amazing yeah. sense of humor. Just any anecdote you would like to share or any of his quotable quotes? You know, the last, the one thing that he said, I will never forget. He said, if he found out that God supported apartheid, he will bend the Bible and throw it away <laughs> because God can't support a racist system. And I thought it was too much of a threat to the Bible. <laughs> but I think he was making the point that God can't support a racist apartheid system.
Iran's nuclear program is said to be far more advanced today as a result of the Trump administration's withdrawal from the 2015 nuclear deal in 2018. Experts say Iran is already quite close to the nuclear threshold. This means the amount of time Tehran would need to make enough enriched uranium for a bomb is probably very short. In a last-ditch effort, talks to resurrect the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, the eighth so far, will restart this week after a brief pause. For more on the deal, our guest on Diplomatic Channel this week is Professor Sharif Folari, who is the immediate past head of the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Covenant University. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. The Iran nuclear deal has had several setbacks over the past few months. Many have held these round of talks as a make or break. How optimistic are you that this deal can be saved or are we at the end of the road? Well, I think that um, it's a defining moment for um, peace in, in, in the Middle East and indeed for um, uh, what will eventually become of um, you know, the capability of Iraq, Iran in terms of uh, acquiring nuclear weapons and indeed the capacity of the uh, superpowers to be able to contain uh, not only Iran, but also ensure that there is peace in the Middle East. So indeed, it's a defining moment. But I would say that um, uh, we don't have dark clouds hanging in the, in the air around these uh, nuclear talks. I would say that uh, there seems to be a ray of hope in terms of the fact that there, are, there is disposition on the part of uh, some of these Western powers, particularly um, as dictated by the European Union leadership. Uh, they want to see an end to this um, Iranian nightmare in terms of stockpiling of, uh, rich, um, uh, stockpiling of uh, uranium and indeed the tendency for Iran to want to develop uh, uh, nuclear capabilities in terms of uh, uh, having nuclear warheads. Um, I would say that uh, the European Union leadership is favorably disposed to having a truce and indeed a, um, a pathway that will uh, end up in um, a total uh, solution to the uh, imbroglio that is, uh, that, that is ensuing in the last uh, two years, not just a few weeks or a few months, two years ever since the United States pulled out of this nuclear deal. And of course, we also have um, a couple of uh, uh, countries that are superpowers, but also nuclear powers, such as uh, Russia and uh, China, that are part of the, um, the uh, seven or six nation you know, uh, group that will be talking to Iran or having a round table to see to it that Iran is able to kind of um, uh, denuclearize and indeed put down all of these, uh, you know, nuclear um, uh, arms uh, development that she's been up to for some years now. So having that, uh, these two factors in play, that is European Union, people will be disposed to it. And of course, Russia and China also wanting an end to it. I would say that there seems to be uh, some kind of uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Well, officials have warned that the Iran nuclear deal would become pointless within weeks if Iran continues to step up its nuclear activities, and it has been doing um, since 2019. Do you think Iran is playing for time here? Well, I would say that, uh, you know, it's, it's international politics, and international politics, uh, national interest, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, is paramount in any, you know, in whatever that uh, nations are doing. Now, for Iran, it has a bargaining chip. The bargaining chip it is nuclear capacity. The bargaining chip is, of course, its intentions, which are well advertised globally, to develop nuclear weapons. No doubt about it. Even though it keeps saying it, you know, um, in a subtle way that it, it has no intentions, no such intentions of developing nuclear weapons. But it's very clear. When, when you study the body language of the political leaders in Iran, you will know that, indeed, this is what they are trying to do. It's like a chess game. And so they put the king, they put, they put whatever it is, they put these things wherever they think they can put, and then they try to pull some strings and see to it, to try to see to it that what powers are able to strike a balance with them. We mustn't forget the fact that 
uh, Iran is considered to be one of those countries, particularly from the point of view of United States foreign policy, one of those countries that belong in the address of, um, uh, of evil. And when a country that belongs in the axis of evil has nuclear capacity, then of course, the entire international community is endangered. So the Western uh, you know, uh, bloc sees it. And so what Iran is doing is to kind of throw so a little bit of uh, you know, um, um, you know, carrots before the international community, particularly before the world, world powers that look, if you are able to remove all of these sanctions, if they're able to persuade those countries, particularly the United States, that have imposed maximum sanctions on, on her, then of course she's going to denuclearize. So what are we saying? Iran says that it doesn't want to, you know, uh, it's not actually having a nuclear program that uh, turns towards having nuclear warheads. But then on another breath, it's saying that, look, we will leave, we will totally um, denuclearize when you are able to lift sanctions. What are we saying? You will see that they are speaking with two sides of their mouth. So, well, yes, they are playing, playing for time, no doubt. But at the same time, they, 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 they actually have the Western powers and indeed the international community right you know, in their, in, 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 uh, on, on their palms. And as such, they could try to spin whatever they want to spin to see that these things work in their favor. Ultimately, I believe very strongly that um, uh, going by the fact that the United States administration today, the nature of the gov of government of the United States today is such that is positively, positively disposed to being present, uh, being a uh, pain and oversight uh, uh, role, and of course also ensuring that there is some control on Iran's nuclear program. Um, uh, having that kind of disposition will mean that there is a likelihood that there will be some lifting of sanctions and then there's also the likelihood that Iran may be a little bit honest about uh, her or its, you know, um, intentions to see to it that there are no nuclear wars uh, development. With Tehran feared to be weeks away from a point of no return on nuclear weapons, are we looking down the barrel of an arms race in the Middle East? And what are the implications of that? I really don't see any arms race in the Middle East. Um, well, I would say that um, uh, right now we have, uh, there's a balance of terror. Uh, if Iran goes ahead and develop uh, nuclear weapons, there is and Israel that will always, uh, you know, kind of even things. But we must understand the fact that while Israel is not strictly speaking, uh, you know, um, geopolitically regarded as a Middle Eastern country, it's seen more like as an European country, but it's well situated in the Middle East. We look at it purely from a geographical perspective and not the political angle of it. So we would say that um, there will be, uh, you know, um, some kind of scaling up of nuclear uh, capacity on the part of Israel, and then there might be, well, maybe what well, that's what you mean by arms race, there might be some kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, more arsenals being uh, invented and developed by, by Israel, but we must understand the fact that Iran is a newcomer in this game. Uh, Israel is far ahead when it comes to such capacity, and uh, nuclear arms race will happen only when, uh, you know, Iran has allies around, around her, but but I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I, I want to think aloud that um, Iran doesn't seem to be in the best of books of even uh, Arab countries. So uh, Iraq is definitely not you know, an ally of Iran. And um, a few countries that are allies of the United States, such as Saudi Arabia, um, uh, Jordan, um, uh, Oman, um, and a couple of them, United Arab Emirates and a couple of, these are not nuclear powers, but I'm not sure that they will, uh, you know, kind of fold their arms and then uh, watch as uh, Iran becomes more of a, of a potential and real nightmare for the entirety of the Middle East. I'm not sure that they will not call Iran to order. And I'm not sure that Iran can quickly, um, uh, will, will be able to match up with mm -hmm. what you know, uh, some countries uh, in, in like Israel and uh, those Western countries that are not too far from Israel, such as Turkey and the rest of them, have already been able to have in terms of nuclear nuclear capacity. Well, thank you so much for your time on Diplomatic Channel, Professor Sharif Folari.
And that's the program today. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember, you can catch up on all our other episodes on youtube.com forward slash channels web. I'm Tenyola Shoboale. Bye for now. <laughs>